good evening and welcome to um, the new Princeton Public Library and to US One Poets and Bite. Uh, we're very thrilled to be able to have this program here in our wonderful new library. Poetry reading tonight is one of the wonderful things we have to offer in the library. When Ellen Foos of US One Poets contacted me and said she would like to do something like this, I said wonderful because this is exactly the kind of program that we want to be doing in the library, a community-based literary program. How can you get any better than that? Um, the program is co-sponsored by the library and US One Poets and the Arts Council of Princeton. And uh, this is our first one we're going to be doing one the fourth Monday of the month. Uh, so the next one will be May 26th. Wednesday. 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 Ah. It is Wednesday. Thank you. And uh, and then in June we will be having it on June 23rd. 23rd. Thank you. Um, I want to give the podium over to Ellen Foose, who will be introducing our invited poets tonight and then moderating the open mic afterwards. So thank you once again for coming, and I know we're all in for a wonderful evening. Thank you. Hi, and welcome everybody. I'm Ellen Foose, and uh, I'm really happy that Sue was open to the idea of this reading series. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, we've already got people scheduled all the way through the fall. Um, and we'll just be keeping everybody informed about who those people are going to be. Um, I just, I do again want to thank Sue Roth at the library and then Janet Stern at the Arts Council that are co-sponsoring the event. Uh, the sheet is over there. If people want to sign up for the open mic, we'll do that after we'll have the first two poets and then a short break and then we'll do the open mic. Um, Carlos has uh, two poets tonight, Carlos Peña, Hernandez Peña and Lois Marie Herod are going to be reading. Um, they both have books for sale back there. Uh, Carlos has kindly offered if people want to uh, pick up his book and then read through it along with while he's reading and then you can decide to keep it or uh, turn it back in. But I think it's just a nice way to be able to read along, so feel free to pick one of those up. Um, so I'll introduce Carlos first, and then um, he'll read for about 20 minutes, and then I'll introduce Lois. Carlos was born in Mexico City, and he uh, has lived all in different places in uh, the United States since moving here. Um, he's working on some short stories in Spanish. Uh, he can maybe explain that to you, how his writing and seems to be fiction is in Spanish and his poetry is in English, uh, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, and he's a great member of the group. We really uh, have a lot of fun reading each other's poems and talking about it. If people are interested in the US Wine Poets Cooperative, you can talk to me. Uh, we meet every Tuesday night. And uh, we really uh, hope that everybody who is interested will also participate in open mic either tonight or at the next uh, event. So um, let me welcome Carlos. Thank you, everybody for being here. It is a special moment, definitely. Um, I'll quote something that I always wanted to quote that I never did. It's wonderful to be here. It's certainly a thrill. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a lovely audience. Um, I put this together. I want to start with um, something by, um, as an introduction, a Chilean woman name is Cecilia Vicuña. She's been translated by Elliot Weber, who also translated uh, Octavio Paz. But she can write in Spanish, in English, and Quechua, the, the language, the people of the um, highlands of the Andes. And it starts, Puyo mama, licencia que manja, madre de las nubes, Licencia pil para pasar. Mother of clouds, grant me to go through. Island prayer, Cecilia Vicuña. Shadows on the wall. After an eventful dinner and bedtime, full moonlight casts shadows on our inside wall. Dancing leaves on branches like puppet shows in old house. I chose a ton of words and voice after hours of nocturnal silence 
arrives all with daylight. In an adventure returns, a gesture suspended in the kitchen, sweet burn mid air. The little one's morning meal, no doubt. A safety net of habits shows itself an illusion too. It appears to hold answers to a lifetime of questions. What are we here for? What is life for? I will explore this unfolding day alone. Tonight, shadows may return or put that whiteness on a bedroom wall. Found opera and stones. This rock formation and the water flowing downhill echo and witness all passers-by. How can I learn anything if I cannot listen to these stones laying around? And these clouds I find, like a theater stage, always shifting shape, blues and blues, fine counterpoint, never mind the rhyme. I found a note I wrote a while ago, lifts ahead of a nose with tops as horns, an old tribal idol, a mask, a towel, a tall woman wearing a long gown shirt as a nightgown. This body of mine fades into sleep at 4 a.m. on the sofa. After I come back from a labyrinth of dreams, morning light opens my day. The first found object is a newspaper article from six months ago I rediscovered last night. Sally Tenbergen from Germany created the first prior in Tibetan for blind Tibetan children. Her story will be the subject of an opera. Music by Philip Black. Sally Tenbergen knows how to read in the dark. So what if I cry? It wouldn't be the first time I cry when listening to opera. I don't know how to read in the dark. So, so a, a small, small pause to explain a little bit this writing in English and in Spanish. I start writing in Spanish in Mexico City. Short days. I would never dare so much for me to try to write for it. I see pen. Living here in English and write it. Don't know. Sorry. As if Spanish speaking writers don't know that I'm writing poetry. <laughs> and if you have a better explanation, I'll take it. You know? um, an old story. Adopted multiple parents to raise me. Actors and actresses, of course. Subtitle, color, image, or black and white. Instinct, accident, and choices. The old story, father leaves home. Afterward, mother does too. Once alone, my extended nursing becomes a movie house. A movie house. Um, a movie. After Lulu on the Bridge, a film directed by Paul Oster, who happens to be a writer, who happens to be a poet and a translator. I have great admiration for Paul Foster, so I couldn't help it. After Lulu and Bridge, is dreaming before dying, almost knowing? Is there knowing while we are alive or living only? Lulu and the Bridge, title for the movie, inside a movie. How come a blue light stole? Stolen from a dead man. We never see provenance of either one. Musician takes it from the dead man, meets woman, who saw the now dead man alive. Musician gives her the stone. In the movie, she listens to his music. In his dream, she falls in love with him. Dying musician dreams life before his death. Dreaming musician dies in the movie. The stone. Bridge between oh, dead man and living man, musician mm -hmm. and woman, writing life and death, dream. I start writing in Spanish. Our movies bridge to tie what is disconnected, our everyday life. Death. No images pretending to be relations. Present, inside and beyond our dreams. Mundial. 
charm for our ancestors. Moon milk. Heal their livestock. It appears, I believe, when we are asleep. Cave deposits. Soft whiteness sculpted over ceiling and walls. Dripping water and microbes crystallize in calcite silence. Harvested mud like cream cleans these wounds. Touch me. Next one called imprint. Open curtain and window to find the writing in the letter. Your voice takes flight under my hair, inside my veins, between my teeth. Skin, margin of her presence, delicate surface, feels cold. Sometimes flattery, sometimes desert, on the naked flesh. It only turns her invisible to another pair of eyes, where we find her tears, when we least expect to meet them and greet them. So never kindly look outside, flourish, and it is daylight. And a pause, and a pause to, to thank uh, EU as one worksheets through the last uh, 20, 30 months. Um, it's all been a very supportive and uh, encouraging experience to be able to, to write and then be listened to and listen to other poems in English. Not just from a book, but to listen. Winter Carnival. At night, we dance in costumes. Prince, pirate over water. Wings ensemble, eagle and owl. Innocent hunger returns, bold. Flight on temple explode, silent. Talons pull apart, mask and beak. Mariachi serenades open wounds. We die this snowy dread unwilling to wear a winter dress. Low chambers. Open eyes cannot invent shadows inside a cave. Fingertips weave every crevice and shape. Hollow sounds of ancient rock, stone wall, no grass or dirt on the ground, no warm embrace. My urge for shards of clay, metal, or carved wood brings no sign of earlier presence, not one bone. Limestone texture prevails over this space, not taste or smell of flesh. On my knees, I crawl. Mountain spring. Every morning, climb to the spring. I welcome unexpected impressions. A dragonfly points to a walking stick. Rattlesnakes down the stream hiss their message. A fawn appears, quiet, alert, not frightened. Five hawks fly their circles. Young eagle rises over pine trees. Leaning on my stick, I reach the mountain top. Without a longing to dissolve, I swim and drink from the spring. This waterfall pursues nothing but a river. Mist over skin and stone, almost kissing. In the cliff, low past twilight, flowers whisper. And then a flower, but the flower is actually another movie <coughs> um, that I found interesting. And, and again, I couldn't help it, but try something about it. Magnolia. One of the characters has this uh, dialogue in the movie. The hardest thing of all is to forgive. To forgive. What can you forgive? From the film Magnolia by P.T. Anderson. Calculated mother's risk. Young father's impulse. How to respond. How does anyone know? Black tide and robes, shores of desire, river, sand, campfire, do they forgive? 
father sitting on his old style chair diverts my attention, not unusual, blows me aside as a birthday candle, another number, not a physical threat. Moonless night cries midwife's song, draws me from deep asleep into water sound. Mirth waves rock your petals, magnolia, air and morning, tears and coffee. Dream, not from a film, floats, serving no purpose or cause, it stands behind gravity, fearless. Deep silk eyes. Feline light, playful fingers, halt the speed and pain. Deflect impulsive course, a dark space disappears. Radiant candle dissolves black walls of corpses. Truths chamber, chambers in electric violets, cotton whites. <coughs> Light invites looking, vast unexplored ocean. Blue barrels follow rhythmic touch. On their silk eyes, her kindness, <coughs> her peace. Healing morning, healing. Light, light. Um, I particularly like the next one because it sort of uh, tells the story. And maybe I can write short stories in English too. <laughs> Far from this village, our trickster cat runs to play hide and seek. My daughter convinces me. We follow him. Where is he going? I rest on a rock and watch as they cross the familiar brook. Silence. Before I can stand up, the arms of a tiger encircle me. He whispers, snakes. He burns behind my neck, snakes. I stand still. I want to remain alive. Where is my daughter and her cat? What is the price of their freedom and mine? I lock the tiger's hind legs within mine. He doesn't move, but I hear his smile. We wrestle in silence, his orange fur all around me. From the corner of my eye, I see my daughter running back home. I ask the tiger, where is our cat? This time, he's louder, he's loud. He jumps up and disappears into the woods. As I return to the house, I see our four cats, the elder, the tramp, the youngest, and the trickster, sharing our living room with new friends like twins, four snakes. Was the front door left wide open on purpose? They laugh with my daughter as she stares at me. Wish. Man boils, I read, cow brains for the fatty acid, cures hides of elk, deer, antelope, and mountain goat. Nourishment, nourishment, company, profit, and beauty, innocent giving in life as in death. All I have is tissue cells beyond repair not to be trusted with presence or meaning. Nothing lasts under my skin or in that thin space we call sleep. I wish tomorrow ancient hands carved out of my femur a foot. Winged scavengers dance, shifting airborne flesh. Um, I would like to, to finish as I started with um, Spanish, Quechua, and English. It's Mushai Mangala. Upalai, Yukanshi Kanshi, Alfa Yalu, Waya Nina, Yukanshi Kashun, Shaska. Kui, Shina, Samai, Mishki, Yuini, Wakai, Kipa, 
upaya Yarabi Kumar Shuti. In Spanish, that becomes Besando Arcilla, Silencio, Somos Tierra, Agua, Viento, Fuego, Soplo Limpio, Prisa, Dulce Silbido, Lamento, Después, Silencio, Anónimo. For the English version, I um, ask, um, I know, to, to allow me to write an introduction. Her book actually is uh, recently been published by the University Press, and you can find that at the news store. They tell me that I am the woman of the ocean that I bring wisdom in my hands, that I am a child woman, but that I can speak with heroes. At times, I cry, but when I whistle, nobody frightens me. Maria Sabina in Lengua Mazateca, Oaxaca. Kissing clay, we are silence, fire, earth, wind, water, clean breeze, sweet whistle, lament, then silence. Um. So my first invitation was to poetry. Poetry is not dangerous. Poetry doesn't kill. There was an article in the paper that you should be aware of poetry a couple of weeks ago. Poetry is, is to explore and, and enjoy. Um, my other invitation is to the Princeton Art Museum. They have a wonderful exhibit of pre-Columbian instruments. Um, from possibly America all the way down to Chile. Um, now with computers, you can just touch your area, your tribe, your instrument, and listen. It's wonderful. Thank you very much. My name is Carlos Hernandez. Okay, I want to uh, introduce Lois Harris now. Um, and just make sure everyone who is interested in uh, reading in the open mic sign up You know, as soon as we break again. Uh, to me, Lois is you know one of the really um, mainstays of US cooperative. Um, she's really inspired. She's had several books published. Um, the one I'm most familiar with is uh, the uh, Spelling the World Backwards. I really love it. She's got some great titles and that's one of my favorites. Um, she teaches school, uh, high school English and creative writing. She's got several uh, grants from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts. Um, She's just a real pro, and uh, the thing I also love about her writing is it's very compassionate and um, a real sense of strength in the writing. I really like uh, you know, how strong everything she writes is. A lot of conviction, so here's one. Thank you, Ellen, and I also uh, owe a great thanks to US1. I, I came much more regularly than I do now because um, I'm getting old and I'm getting tired and <laughs> I have trouble staying up after 9.30. But I love US1 and I, I think without them I would not have written nearly as much as I did over the years since I guess about 1985, a long time already. Uh, I thought that I would read some new work to you, uh, things that have been published in the last year or so, although some of them were written much um, 
more than a year ago. Uh, and I noticed as I was choosing these poems that, that some of my old subjects keep reappearing. And one of them is that life of a teacher. The first poem is called Bread. Um, the odd thing about being a teacher, of course, is you don't know what you're doing. Um, you throw your uh, crumbs on the water, your bread on the water, and you never know when it's going to come back. Bread. Sometimes the past returns as a student whose knees seem too narrow to bear his classmates' jeers. Queer. Faggot. His voice so foreign, you astonish yourself when you call out his name, Michael, and it is. He's traded his thin white arms for a leather jacket and shoulders broad enough to hang a sleeve. A soldier now, holding the sky above Somalia, an ebony bowl in his hands. His friends have told him to write the stench of Mogadishu. He has friends now, but he wants to tell you about the white stars rising above the desert. And as he looks at your ceiling, the lights seem to float like a basket of bread in the evening. Thus he begins singing his songs. This boy, whom you do not remember saying a word in your class, his voice now a white loaf in the sand, and all around, the students roll up their eyes from their dry study as if they too were hungry, and you wonder what crust you could have thrown him that made him come back to you today. I always hate this. I always have students who join the Army, and uh, I, I always am afraid for them. Uh, this one was uh, for a young African-American student I had who loved Shakespeare's My Mistress Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun Coral is far more red than her lips red. If hair be wires, why, I missed the line. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hair be wires, black wires grow on her head. So this is called Survival Kit and um, it's about, you know, dyslexia too, about someone who would call sad slob because that's what it looked like to them. Survival kit. What's this slab? said the girl, whose letters flipped themselves. She was opening the tin of methyl salve I had handed to her, something for her ashy hands. Slav, one of the ur tongues, gold, frankincense, and mutilation. The ointment I kept in my desk with tissues and band-aids. Now she stood dressed in her marine uniform, black wire smoothed into a bun. She had come back to see me. How delighted she had been to learn Shakespeare meant someone like her. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. My lovely African-American student with the oddly Jewish name, Esther Morgenthal. No longer anguished as she had been that day when someone stole her assignment book and wrote, get lynched under January 15th. Now she stood before me as if that nastiness had never happened. We both knew the troops were gathering in the East, where King Solomon's dark lady had dipped her violet foot into the Indian Sea. And what vexed her now was that I was not properly patriotic, O oh, ye of so much faith. So raise high your classroom, teacher, and make a promised land. The dusky, the dusky perfume of Bathsheba turning towards Jerusalem, turning towards desolation. And the last school poem, one I would have never written without students complaining that any poem over 10 lines long is too long. <laughs> Length. Don't grow too long, the writer said, who will read you. 
But like a comet, the poem had rules of its own. Night, luminescence, a fuzzy scripting of stars. Wait, stop, said the writer. You're already two asteroids too long. But the poem wouldn't listen. It was beyond satellite, stretching itself from Venus to the swan, butting its white head against the moon. It didn't look down to see if watchers were looking up. It couldn't ask what such length signified, fortune or omen. Anything that long must mean or be, but who had the patience with a poem the width of the cosmos. If it has something to say, why doesn't it just say it, said one watcher and turned on his television. Nobody will read you, the writer said. So what, said the poem, no one needs to. There was never more than one reader here, whatever you imagined. VCRs, topless bars, past lives. Um, I guess one. another source, Big or Max, continuous heart source uh, of my work. Mickey Mouse, Art House. And uh, this one is based after all those uh, comma-shaped nostrils that Picasso puts on his women, you know, like that. All right. <laughs> Her comma-shaped nostrils like hot balloons after Picasso. They hadn't fed the damn house for months, but now she didn't want to leave it empty. For God's sake, he said, it's not starving. Toss the carrots into the disposal and let's go. No, she said lightly, throwing a French word back into the closet they could never fill. Absolutely no. Just because we've always starved it doesn't mean we must starve it now. He thought about how inserting French into an English sentence requires an acrobatic mouth. But she was already tearing the boxes, pie pans, rolling pin, measuring cups, spoon. At the kitchen counter, she sifted the flour. She rolled out the crumbly crust. Outside, he was revving the motor in his third language. Toujours les mots. Damn it, she would make an apple pie before she left. Defying gravity, her tears fell and rose. I don't know, I was doing a very strange series for a while, self-portrait as a raccoon, <laughs> self-portrait as a piano. Uh, this is one from that series, it's um, self-portrait as a bathroom mirror. And it's the mirror that's talking. Can you see yourself in me, clothed, or after your bath, wet and naked? Your hair in ringlets, mascara circumscribing your eyes. Your lashes, those of one who weeps when she is alone, who hides her mouth in a lipstick grin. Here, take a tissue and wipe it off see what she really is. After a while, you begin to realize that there's a very little relation sometimes between the artwork and the poem. But um, sometimes I keep that just because that's where the poem started. Not a good reason to keep something, I know. This is um, after a uh, beautiful blackware vase jar by Margaret Tafoya. Blackware. Light knows the deep as a child scratches a desk. Shallow words, Yahweh, grief. And any man can hear black velvet scrape towards dawn and later dark laughter raise the dusk. So it is not difficult to see how night conceals its stars in clay pictures, or how the womb reads the face of water. Even the ginkgo can touch herself in albino darkness, and snowflakes fall when the streetlights inexplicably go out, allowing ice to bite the white corner of the eye and black water to fill the mouth. Nightly, the old Chinese woman rinses her hair in black tea. Did she have a husband? Did he die before he knew? 
and one uh, perhaps some of you have heard, a seated couple after Egon um, Shield. I love this. It's, it's, it's a picture that looks like there are five, two people in five legs. Seated couple. There comes this moment when the beast with two backs has five legs and neither face can tell if the extra is real or prosthetic. And he says to her, this is your leg. It wears your green stocking. And she says, no, it is yours, muscular and hairy, unlike my smooth and suppliant one. And why are you putting on my shoes? So they try to feel it back to its source and he runs his hand up the thigh until she begins to moan. And he says, see, it is your leg. And she sighs, no, for she is running her hand up his thigh and he is moaning too. And there it is, the other leg. Anyone can see as she sits behind him, as he sits behind her, five legs. And the fifth belongs to neither and both, the leg that everyone touches and no one knows. Um, I love myth. I love its archetypes. Uh, so uh, I'll be playing this Acid one. Rain. Rogan. It's called Cocaine. From Labyrinth America. to Linear. Cell phones, and, uh, nursing homes, I suppose the myth that folds. is behind a lot of it is uh, that old story of Daedalus and uh, Labyrinth he made and his son Icarus who wouldn't listen and fell. From labyrinth to linear, we can hear the labor in the muse. Daedalus at hawk and handsaw, far-sighted and sweating. Oh, we get ourselves into muddles and can't get out. Did you bring the brief candles? Imagination waxes the body, but the sun wicks it and wanes. And somewhere above, the stars keep splitting the comet's hair. What, log what logic lasts more than a month? Any lathe can round the rigid corners of sense, spin substance into air, turn wisdom into grief. Though each letter mazes its astonishing way through the corn, we want more than meaning, more than Icarus dropping his plumb line into the world. Nature, like Carlos has so many poems with water and, and nature, and, and uh, rather than the, the warm weather that's in your poems, this is one in which there's the, ar the Arctic. What the polar bear sings, white on white, the slip of midnight clouds on midnight snow, the stretch of Arctic ice flow to flow, and the waiting at the breaks where the seal rises to bask and breathe. I walk miles for the occasional meal, the black snout nudging death, the long sleep through summer, that living off what I can store of white despair, while those darker brutes, black and grisly, wander at the edges of the light I bear. And I'll end with um, three poems about family, which uh, seems to be a subject of mine. Um, my mother, I, I always think she is famous for always giving back anything you give to her. So over the years, we've gotten back about every gift except for candy. She keeps candy and eats that. Um, and uh, 
If you're young, you probably don't remember that wonderful blue that uh, Evening in Paris perfume used to come in. Oh, it's just this wonderful little blue bottle that I envied as a child. My mother's house coat. Here, take it. I won't wear it. Perfume on the stopper, blue as ink spilling the page. Bottle glass blue, arteries too heavy for my clavicle. You bought it for me. My mother's face still within her theatrical fragrance. Topaz, evening in Paris, Hawaiian ginger. To be as I am, smaller than a whiff lacking her green flashes, red hair, her eyes like limes. Oh, she could be sour and strong, forcing the thumb back into its socket. I do not have such redolence, the grunt and grit to drag myself from garage to kitchen the day I fall from the stepladder and crack my hip. But everything happens once and then again, a different odor. Now she rubs the swollen wrist. Maybe I should have seen it at the doctor. She asks again, here, take it home and wear it. This housecoat still breathing something I do not want to breathe. Till she uh, had a hip replacement. <laughs> Fox gloves. So many entries into the body. The five fingers, the senses, the thousand delicate caves of foxy pleasure, and then the follicles, the pox. My 89-year-old mother after her hip replacement, the pores on her necks like craters, dry tunnels for thick needles, and then her anger sting as I tried to keep her from tearing out the IV poked into and taped to her forearm, tried to keep her from tearing out the catheter. It pinches, she said, it burns. How do they expect me to pee with that stuck in? God doesn't want us to be manipulated, she said, a word I had never heard her use. This woman with a fifth grade education who had always left theology up to my father, this woman who had been a shy and docile wife, now snippy and witty under the lingering influence of anesthesia. She wanted to go home. What would Dad say? Dad died, I said gently. You must stay. Shit, she said. Damn. Words I did not know she knew. Word that must have entered her ears when she was small buzzing in her head for decades, damn, poking and prying, pricking away, waiting for an entrance. I didn't ask for this operation, she said. When did you go over to the nurse's side? What did those doctors say to suck you in? She tried to get out of bed. She tried to go home until the nurses in their gloves brought restraints. They were violet gloves. She said, violet and foxglove blue. I just want to die, she said. It was you, not me, who wanted this operation. It was you. All righty. A recent poem from uh, the years of uh, bearing children and having children running around. The Conundrum. He was wearing his argyle eyes snapping them shut as he read from the Anacreon, I'm sorry, from the Anacreon. And she was trying to listen to his gibberish while the baby in her gooey face was shaking the marshmallow baboon by the elbow. You never listen to me, he said. You never slither along this kitchen sink to burble in my ear as you did when you were scrumptious and pumpernickel in the goo -gah. What? She said. The baby was fluffing the chinchilla in the tomato sauce. You never bat your luscious carnations or wear your velvet clock. The baby was crawling out the door. See what I mean, he said, as she ran after. You never did hear what I said. <laughs> and uh, I guess I'll finish with, with one more. The second hand sonnet. Uh, this, uh, was published a long time ago by Blue Line and then reappeared in their anthology. And uh, it was 
when I was writing a long sonnet series that uh, hasn't ever been published. Seven Eleven, Armageddon, the second Superhero, the Great Ground Zero, 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 the orb spinner scaffold, or often in the meadow, the cribbolate's airy tease. I do not need beauty, but stickiness and subtle strength, a gossamer for speckled eggs, a strand, a stitch, a purse of leaves. Such is my beginning, the secondhand silk. Some say camouflage, coating the throat in another's craft, but I have begun to say, ineluctable glimmer, for what I cannot see myself becomes light passing, not through my nest, but through the trees. Thank you so much. Gail Gaspar, and I've dedicated the last year to an illustrated poetry collection, and I'm just in the process of coming out with it. Father Gilermo seeks the flesh of the fruit. Not by bread alone can a man, even a padre, live. No, not by bread alone, though the Santa Fe nights, spackled lavender and teal, satisfy the innermost sanctum of the soul. Though Senora Dulcinda Carimba de Luz brings un bolo to the table of the Mission San Miguel each morning. The Padre, she knows, prefers prayer to conversation, and so she returns to the courtyard of the Mission San Miguel each evening in silence, leaving behind always a soup for the Padre, a quiet man who prefers prayer to conversation. Still, it is no secret to the Senora that Father Gilermo, more than he longs for the waterways of Venice, more than he longs for the dome of the basilica, longs for the flesh of the pear. The senora has seen his silhouette as he sits at the wide open window facing the orchard where the fragrant fruit infuses the night air of the courtyard of the mission San Miguel. Yes, Father Gilermo prefers the flesh of the pear fruit. In nearby Bernardo, Monsignor Boteri marks the passing of the days, the feast of San Lorenzo, the feast of San Antonio, the feast of San Pablo, and considers the blessings of the beast and the impending visit of the Archbishop Cantal. From the window of Mission San Miguel, Father Gilermo Restless observes his orchard, and from his bedside almanac counts the days until the golden pears redden and dangle like rubies, indisputable gifts of the Magi from the upturned branches of the tree. Thank you. I'm Kathy Palka. Um, I have a spring poem to read, a seasonal poem, um, that's set in one of my favorite places in New Jersey. It's um, at the Teeter Town Preserve, which is a park in the northwest corner of Huntington County. It's titled Future Wilderness. And it begins with an epigraph um, from Frost. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. Above Califon, the timeless blue of a crisp April morning gleams on the pond at Mountain Farm. Higher still along the rocky slope, the trail enters the woods, then travels down the edge of what my map names Future Wilderness. I've come to find this place where the future returns the past. As the path parallels a farmer's fence, the ruined mounds snake among trees. The old neighbors good or otherwise, are gone, and the cows, too. No one has made a friendly game of wall mending in 80 years. Each freeze and thaw has had its way. No pines or apples grow, but oaks, sycamores, beech, maples, and the delicate white dogwoods have crossed the fallen stones to take back ground cleared long ago. The woods are rich again in shadows, riotous with bird song and the scurry of animals, deep in the mischief of spring. Without our care to wall it out or in, the land relives itself, and the wild returns from the time before our fathers ever spoke of fences. All right, Connie Bryson. 
Thank you. Thank you for helping me here. Um, it's called America. And I would say just about exactly 50% of it's pretty patriotic, but uh, I think you'll, you'll figure out what's going on here. America. Cornfields, drug deals, saying grace, spraying mace, confetti, graffiti, America. Hot tubs, billy clubs, styling moose, child abuse, condos, winos, America. Apple pie, right to die, star search, strip search, personals, arsenals, America. Emptiness, urine tests, reruns, handguns, tofu, voodoo, America. VCRs, topless bars, past lives, battered wives. Big Macs, heart attacks, America. Mickey Mouse, crack house, college boards, slum lords, blue corn, kitty porn, America. Teflon, radon, David Blaine, acid rain, Rogaine, cocaine, America. Cell phones, nursing homes, jello molds, centerfolds, X-Files, pedophiles, America. Vanna White, urban blight, game shows, death rows, Tampax, anthrax, America. Shopping carts, body parts, rock and roll, gun control, slurpees, herpes, America. Park and ride, suicide, emails, she-mails, early detection, lethal injection, America. SATs, STDs, touchdowns, meltdowns, end zone, ozone, America. Spiced ham, son of Sam, surrogate moms, hydrogen bombs, 7-Eleven, Armageddon, America. Superhero, ground zero, Austin Powers, Twin Towers, potato chips, apocalypse, America. Thank you. What is very appropriate for this day of leadership? It says, follow me. I'll give you bread, the very life of life. I followed him, and I died. Follow me, he said, for I'm the truth and eternal light. I will deliver you from evil and evildoers. I followed him, and I died. Follow me, he said, I'll give you liberty and the joy of happiness. I followed him and I died. The second one is more or less in the same mode. I learned from Harvey last year that the word brown can also mean sad. So Harvey, I'm trying to live up to that. <coughs> I wanted to meet you at ground zero. Wise men taught me to respect my elders. You sure are old, much older than me. You've been there from the beginning of time, maybe even longer. You're kind and loving and watching over me. They all said so. You used to do wondrous things. The holy men say in melodious tongues and sacred words, some carved in stone in ancient lands. I sang your praises with folded hands on bended knees in Sanskrit and Greek, in Hebrew and Latin and Arabic too. Did all that singing put you to sleep? When you get that old, can you see it all? Can you still hear when so many call? I cried for you in the ovens of Auschwitz. I, I called your name from the mile-high mile inferno of the towering towers before I jumped to meet you on a New York street. Where were you? <laughs>